Hello, everyone. It is the time once again for a new episode of MCL Talks, brought to you by the Manila Composers Lab. I am Juro Kimfeliz, a Toronto-based composer and a graduate of McGill University in Montreal. Joining me for today's episode are our usual roster of panel members who are also the founders of the Manila Composers Lab. We have colleagues based in the Philippines, including composer Jonas Baez of the University of the Philippines, composer and conductor Alexander John Villanueva, who serves as the artistic director of the Ripian Ensemble, and also soprano Pauline Therese Arejola, who is the project coordinator of ongoing MCL projects. We are happy to have Austria-based composer Feliz Ann Makahis from Kunst Universität Graz and Germany-based film composer Marie-Louise Calvero from the Hochschule für Musik Freiburg. Now, it is a great pleasure to have Dominic Quejada as today's featured speaker. Starting his composition ventures in the University of the Philippines, Dominic finished a master's degree at the Musikhochschule Lübeck under the mentorship of composer Dieter Mack. As a composer, his works have appeared in numerous programs and festivals from the 2007 ISCM World Music Days in Hong Kong and the Jogjakarta Contemporary Music Festival, all the way to the Festival Links in Heidelberg and the Blurred Edges Festival in Hamburg. He is currently based in Herzogenrat and works as a programmer in the video game developer Egosoft GmbH. And I think it's now time to welcome Dominic here on the forum. Hi, Dominic. Hi, nice to be here. Um, I remember back um, in one of our old interminable conversations, a conversation with um, with Manang Dayang Iraula, where she said that music, no, not music, she was talking about art. She made a very general um, statement about art. She said that the purpose of art is to provoke discussion. And I found that very interesting and very odd. And um, in grappling with that, me as a composer being told that the purpose of what I do is to make something for them to talk about, and that is its only purpose, um, I came to realize that she was speaking from her perspective. She, she's a curator. Speaking from her perspective, that is, of course, the function of art to her field. And that taught me that each of us view things from our own perspectives and speak from our perspectives, um, which in turn leads to, well, I've brought this question up before, which leads to the question of where the art lies, where does the music lie? Um, we negotiate, and I've, I've said this exact spiel before as well, but I'd like to highlight it to start, where um, we live within our own sound worlds at start, we, of course, um, interact with our environment, with society, with our influences, with all of these things. And we create a piece of music which only exists in our head. And we negotiate with performers and they interpret what we wrote and try to play something. And then each member of the audience perceives that and the work then exists in their heads. And then sometimes that work propagates outwards to a larger world, which then goes back to the composer interacting with his environment. So it's a big feedback loop. Having said that, I would like to present, I think this is my second work. It's called Paghinga. Um, it was written for solo flute, and with no further comment, let's listen to it and see if I need art according to Diane.
So I'll probably pose the first question because you were talking about the composer as uh, responding to the environment, right? So mm -hmm. it uh, and that in a sense creates a sort of feedback loop. You were um, so I really am curious, probably as to like how this composition came about. Then what was the environment? Um, the environment was UP College of Music in two thousand one back when I was starting out, and this was all new to me. Paghinga is a Tagalog word. It means um, the act of breathing. I was always in awe of people who could play well, because I never could. Um, I, I, I spent years learning various instruments. I even had a semester where, if I remember correctly, I only had one major and three minors, where I was studying three different instruments, and I wasn't taking any other courses. That was all I was doing. And um, I realized, and, and this was when it was all new to me. Um, I, I was listening to, um, if I remember correctly, Vares and Crum. Shakuhachi was new to me. Um, seeing, being in an environment where people played every day was new to me. And I realized that when you listen to someone playing the flute, you're actually listening to the person breathe. You're, you hear the person's breath um, articulated and modulated through this instrument. Um, and we as composers have the presumption of essentially telling the person how to breathe for this moment of time. And the person, for whatever reason, finds enough value in what we do to actually play along with what we do. And this is where the music is coming from. And um, that's why the, it's, it's built up of breathing gestures and um, intakes of breath and what follows and the, the material modulating how you breathe after that and et cetera and so on. Um, I have to say though that um, I wasn't, uh, this piece went through two, two revisions, one in 2007, which was fairly major and another one in 2013 just to clear up clean up the score and all that. And I probably can also like follow through with that then because you were thinking about the breathing processes and how performance actually is affected by that. I was really curious though because if you look at the score you will see um the the way you depicted them or the way you represented these uh breaths you, you will actually see rests with accents and i was like on first instinct i was thinking are the rests supposed to be heard here is that like should we actually hear the actual breathing process or was it a concern of yours when you were composing that not so much um it wasn't so much that the breath should be heard as much as the breath should be very deliberate where um rests normally mean no sound and you can do whatever the hell you want as long as there is no sound. Um, accented rests in this particular case refer to breath where you have to breathe or at least I would request kindly that you breathe. So you were really tapping on the uh, mechanism of interpretation at this point, right? Like yes. It really Very depends now on the performer to, to make meaning out of these breaths, so to speak, and just like translate it into sound. Yes. And I think I could generalize um, generalize that to the bulk of my career, I think, where I touched upon the various ways that various sound worlds can emerge from a piece of music. And I think I focused on the internal world that we have and how we bring about system, we construct systems and processes to bring that about and the interaction with the performer. And I neglected the part where the performer actually does something for the audience. I, I think for a large part of my career, that was secondary where the music would just emerge from this process and where whatever would come out of that would be fascinating to me. And, um, it wasn't until I came here and started studying under Dieter Mack when it became apparent. Um, a large difference here is that there is a fairly sizable amount of the population who actually put value in what we do, which was new to me. 
and um, which was really new to me. Like we would have a concert. Admittedly, the the hall would be fairly small, but we would have a concert and the hall would be packed, and that was unknown to me. And there would be people coming up to me afterwards, thanking me for making that. And um, yeah, that was interesting. Okay, at this point, I think uh, we can really also uh, like ask for comments and uh, questions as well from our panel members as well. Well, yes, I remember this piece. I think this was your first piece, uh, Dominic. Second, this is my was second. This the first, a uh, second. Is this the one done in Budapest? I know. I think it was another one mm -hmm. in Budapest, uh, sometime in the two thousands. But let's let's try to redirect to the to the very first. Um, Proposition you you opened with with uh, quoting the young Iraula saying that art is some something like art is there to be talked about. I mean, and then uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, she is a curator and not an artist uh, in that sense. So in a way, a curator uh, it's like a broker in a way, but uh, a more artistic kind of broker. The discourse of art actually is uh, another field of production. The discourse of art is actually the actors in that field are not necessarily artists. You know, you have this, uh, you have these big conferences on the sociology of art, and this, and then you, you find out that the, many of them are not artists. Uh, no offense, but uh, to talk about art in the way that a practitioner talks about art, there's a different level. It can be technical, it can be aesthetic, it can be philosophical, it can be whatever. What exactly do you think of this piece? Is, is, it, is it art in your, in, your, in your case? If you were to well, put it along this frame, uh, which Dayang had, uh, had propositioned? No, to be honest. I mean, I like it. I like the music. This particular piece is my most performed, but it's also the least talked about. So... From that definition of art, I don't know if it is. We don't have to be governed by that proposition because remember that was made with all respects also to the one who said it. That was made by somebody who isn't a practicing artist, who is a curator in fact. So in, 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 this, in this case, your uh, paghinga being art should not be hinged on that proposition. Mm -hmm. Because it's still art, even if you don't talk about it, because it already speaks to you. I mean, uh, do you talk about uh, Beethoven's Emperor Concerto? You don't, because it's already there. It's, it's, it's what it is. Or Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? You don't. Maybe there are side stories and all that stuff. But if you listen to it at a concert, it's there. It has its own discourse. Music itself, I think, has the capacity to create its own discourse. And I think you... You have alluded to that thought in uh, in saying that we have our own sound world. Like as much as we can hear music and the music speaks pretty much uh, for itself and all that, I think it's also very uh, important actually to know like uh, where this is all coming from. And I think uh, like to, to kind of also like... <laughs> Uh, empathize, I would say, with, with some of the people who actually feel the need to actually talk about it before they can fully understand it. I think it's like your, it's their way of actually trying to engage with the work. And as much as music can be received, people also engage with it by also talking about it. And I do think there's also a sort of uh, a merit, I would say, and just like trying to articulate what is inarticulable. <laughs> express the inexpressible. So there's also that kind of room and whether Paghinga can be content, uh, contented as art or not, at, at the end of the day, it depends on who is actually trying to say whether this is art or not. I think it very much depends on the perspective where you're coming from. I used to write, no, I should correct that. I used to pretend to write poetry and I used to say that um, these are the simplest ways I can express these things if I can express them in a simpler way then I wouldn't bother writing poetry and um, in the same way back when I used to write music these are the simplest ways I know to express these things and now they exist 
even just like relying on the works uh, conceptual framework too, like we're exposing uh, the internal processes here at this point, right? So it's not just about sound, it's also about the, the breathing process. So the performer actually plays a role in shaping the music and that in itself is already like a, a, an element of discourse that probably also needs a space for articulation as well, right? So here we're making the invisible visible. I would phrase it in that uh, phrase. You said that this was performed in Hamburg in a bar or what kind of? Yeah, it was at bar. It was in a bar. Yeah, how was the atmosphere? Um, how how different it was from the original performance or how was it? Very formal. Everybody oh. was sitting down. It was a big festival. So um, it was a big festival. Everything was announced and the people who were there were there for the music. And everybody was sitting down. Um, it was informal, I guess, compared to having a concert in a concert hall. But it was surprisingly very formal. Everybody was very quiet. And um, I remember we were just sitting at a table with random people and after my piece was played, my classmates turned to me and to congratulate and other people started noticing and they started to congratulate, which I always feel awkward about. But <laughs> uh, In Montreal, actually, that, uh, I, I feel I relate to that kind of uh, dissonance too. Uh, also just like hearing music in concert halls versus hearing music or hearing this particular kind of musical style uh, being performed in a bar. And probably uh, the difference is really just like uh, in this very bar that I've listened to, or we like we've uh, had music performed to. Uh, there were lots of noises actually, bar noises basically. So it's not really quiet at all. It's like uh, you hear the 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 buddy still like pounding this thing because he's making coffee or something. It's really like uh, there's a lot of ruckus, like plates being sh shuffled here and there and all that. But uh, it's very interesting to hear that uh, you said it's all very silent and people were really like deeply engaged into it what i wanted to talk about next actually has more to do with my coming here and seeing that um that the product um coming from <clears throat> coming out of a fairly long period of my professional career being focused on the process and um, negotiation and all of these things and being thrust into an environment where the product had value. My response to this is this second piece that I would like to perform. It's called Et Pas Das Nur Schön Ist. And literally it translates to, it's, it's difficult to translate exactly, but it, it can mean something, the only purpose of which is to be pretty or nice, schön but it could also mean something that is just should, that is just nice or pretty. And um, <clears throat> this was my attempt at engaging with the audience and giving them something that might be nice. I won't play the whole thing because it's very, very long. But here we go. Thank you. 
It's it's art because after the after you turned off the music, I looked at everybody and everybody was smiling. <laughs> it is art, is it? Because because everybody's smiling. I guess. I mean, if it elicits an emotional response, that is one. I mean, that's not always the case. There is art which is purely intellectual, which I think is entirely valid as well. I could see our conductor AJ in particular smiling at one piece. Was it the one four bars? Uh, no, I think it just reminds me of uh, a lot of the music of the people who are here. <laughs> I, I do get the, how do you say that? Uh, the, the, the concept of what is Shen here in this case, also just because like it's, this is very much typical Neue Musik, I would say, right? This is the language that the, the, the Neue Musik uh, practitioners would actually speak. So it's like, it's also like, just like trying to pull out a familiar friend, like, hey, this is someone who's familiar. And it's like, oh yeah, we know this guy. <laughs> uh, if I remember right, uh, Lachenmann, when he began about in the 70s with his work, was actually confronting uh, the notion of shunness of of of, of uh, beauty in that sense, but apparently uh, many people find this music so beautiful now. I mean, it, it's 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 a different level of beauty. So the beauty, if the notion of beauty is evolving, it's only that notion that is evolving. The music remains. The music was beautiful from to to begin with, actually, and uh, there are certain factors how this beauty is perceived. Uh, one is that mode of production, which is concert, and site of production, which is the concert hall or the bar where during a performance, everybody is quiet and people can perceive. It, it can speak to them. That is a necessary, uh, let's call it a necessary evil for that. And apparently, if you play Lachenmann in the subway, if you play Pression in the subway, and people just have no time to stand and, uh, and uh, listen to the whole thing, uh, that, that would be a different level of reception, right? Or you, if somebody's basking in the subway, for example, the U-Bahn, can you imagine uh, if you don't hear, 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 hear you snippets of it, uh, what, 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 what uh, mode of reception that, that would bring? And, and apparently this shunness, uh, its reception can be qualified in terms of the way by which it is produced and the place where it is produced, actually. Do you agree with me? Yeah, uh, it, um, it, it leads to 
actually funny thing I did actually hear a Lachen Man piece in the subway in Berlin once and um, what struck me about my that performance was how normal it was um, and then in another subway station someone was playing with an accordion with a uh, it was a stereotypical Italian thing which they play with accordions and the response was the same uh, some people would go up and stop some people would go on about their business I didn't see anyone complain and I guess with the stated goal of challenging what aesthetic is, there can be this movement of making something new and that something new becoming normal. And in that way, redefining what we find aesthetically, if not pleasing, then acceptable. And I wonder, is that a goal? I mean, I, I'm not really active in the field anymore, so I won't I don't really have any stated goals anymore, but how much is that a goal with you guys to make something new and hope that maybe at some point that something new that you made will become someday normal? I, I have an insight on that, but in a more general perspective, because right now the whole world is under, I don't know, a kind of lockdown or a kind of um, forced situation that we have to adjust to a lot of new, quote-unquote, new normals. Because um, we were so used to, like, like um, in the writing process, um, we were so used to having a certain routine in our lives, a certain routine in the things that, uh, in how we do the the, the used to be normal things and then now we're trying to to adapt which is not necessarily something um, negative or not a bad thing but we're trying to um, make things work we're trying I don't know maybe to make ends meet some some point because um, we have to sort of make a new normal for for all the things that we cannot do nor in a normal way right now so so it's like generally i think now everybody is trying to devise a new normal not only in art or in music but i think lifestyle in general which i think also affects the way we think um mentally and physically spiritually and or whatever aspect human aspects which will um eventually affect how we write, write music, how we express ourselves, express art, express um, through words or through actions, media, and those kind of things. So, yeah. Maybe I have the other experience. Um, I'm very critical to cliché. If I go to concerts and I hear something that, um, okay, it's even just on the first, on the opening, you already know that, okay, this came from the 80s or from the 90s. It's not anymore like, wow, the structure is great and how it's moving. It's really how it starts. You already get an impression. And um, in my case, because uh, as you know, I'm always interested with voice and I'm very slow with finding my own path, with experimenting with the voice and what I like about it. And then lately when I realized that everybody's doing something with voice, even in the context of concert music with an ensemble, um, I, I have to constantly ask myself, why am I doing this? And like sort of positioning yourself, um, how important is this to me so that I would like to, to keep doing it? Something came to mind actually, because um, you remember the piece Inaita? Inaita, this, this thing where you have this big gong and then you have this weeper and you have these percussion sounds. And remember the, the, the backstory to that. It's, it was meant to be an installation in the sense that it was looping and it's kind of a disturbing sound. And, and I remember, I don't know if you remember also the, the, the stories that when it was, it was installed in the Vargas Museum, people were complaining because it was really very horrifying. And some people were saying that it's invoking the ghost to come out. They're going to broadcast in Naita 
there's this organization which is uh, helping with the plight of the Dumagats, Dumagat people in Rizal. And they did an interview with me weeks ago and uh, they are going to, one of these Saturdays, they're going to broadcast the Naita on radio in, and, and try to, to see the reactions to people, they'll give the backstory. And, and the Naita is not really about beauty, it's about horrifying things. Uh, but at the same time, when I wrote it, I wasn't thinking of beauty, I was thinking of the horrors. At the same time, pe some people appreciated it, although there are many other incidents that happened with regard to that performance. Of course, the complaints in the Vargas Museum. The, uh, I don't know, Dominic, if you heard of the time when I, I installed that in Dubek and the Hausmeisterin in, in the concert hall was shouting in the lobby, asking what kind of music it is. She was, she was, yeah, I wasn't there yet, but you told me about it. Yeah, yeah, and, and then um, uh, they also performed that in a train station in, in Kanazawa in Japan. That notion of site of production and, uh, and this thing which wouldn't actually come out if it were performed at the concert hall and people were watching a concert and seeing that this is music. And that is what I was, I was reminded of when we were talking about sites of production with regards to Paghinga being performed at the bar or uh, you describing uh, a Latin man piece being performed in a train station. And, and, and I think, uh, I don't know if I'm right in, in assuming there's a certain equation with regards to reception and appreciation and insight as the building of aesthetics and this mode as well as the site of production. And I think everybody has performed music in a concert hall and uh, if we have, let's say, the Repian Ensemble playing in the MRT station, I don't know how it will be uh, taken by people. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's quite different. But if there was a singer, of course, and you have somebody singing James Taylor, Taylor or, or, or somebody in, in the subway, that would be different. Because people would stop and give coins and sing with the music, etc. maybe. But, but, but can you imagine no music uh, in, that, in that context? So that was my... Uh, take on that uh, wherever we're going in discussion. I would probably also tie it down to my own experience here, uh, to my own response in experiencing, or, or rather not experiencing, but going through the production of whatever is new, so to speak. Uh, I do find that uh, there's also this conflation actually between like uh, whatever is new and all that, and also like the production of space itself. Or, or, or the creation of space. When we talk about creation of spaces, here we actually talk about uh, like revealing our own voices, revealing our own identities, uh, talking about ourselves, basically. And from what I he see here in North America, referring to what Pauline had uh, talked about earlier as uh, what's the new normal, suddenly you see this plethora of spaces being created, especially online, about artists basically who are like uh, who lost income who lost their jobs and all that who now shifted into a new platform where they can actually showcase i would use the term showcase what their the what their work was it's probably even not as much as searching anymore for what is new as much as actually creating more spaces to present what for them had been the new thing I think uh, many people are not concerned anymore with what else can we do or what else is noe music or whatever, what, what can we still explore? What can we still experiment? It's not even the case anymore. I think it's really just more about like uh, creating the space for people to actually listen to these kinds of things. So Dominic, I was uh, wondering then, because uh, going also back to, referring back to this feedback loop, the composer creating something for the performer and then the, the composer responds to the environment also elicits um, more creation. So there's this feedback loop. I was wondering about the, the concept of composer as performer. Usually we talk about people who compose and also perform their music at the same time. But in this case, it feels like, for me, it feels like we are also tapping into this notion of the composer who actually performs in his space to create composition. Uh, when we start the creation phase, that also initiates 
our own performative. We are actually performing when we write. And I think uh, you had pretty much like explored that not only in Takinga, but also in other works as well. Uh, in the Edvas piece, it's uh, while it's very interesting to see or rather hear very familiar gestures. Oh, this is very much uh, the kind of contemporary music that people would love listening to and all of that. Uh, that. That for me also seems like a performance in itself. Almost an overdetermined um uh, a very self-conscious, overly overdetermined attempt at making something contemporary, I guess, in a way, <laughs> which um, I guess it isn't apparent because we haven't really listened to any of my more typical work. It was an interesting experience to me to try to make something that would be almost deliberately cliche, I guess, and play around with that idea. All right, this piece. This was my very last piece. Um, it's written in seven parts. And at first, I had planned it to be a very deliberate expansion. Um, but then I wanted to, to explore a very specific dramaturgy. I want to show this one. Okay, it was a very deliberate expansion. Um, I was playing around with uh, pitch density um, as opposed to temporal space and um, how denser materials are more concentrated in smaller spaces. But I wanted, out of whim, to write it with a very specific dramaturgy in mind, and that required an, a reorganization. So this, which I hope you can see, turned into this to get this. I, I wanted this shape. So I proceeded with the first part and I was writing it. And when I got to the second part, I, I, I came across a dilemma where I hadn't written six yet. And it was in my mind supposed to be the sixth part, which was supposed to come much, much, much later in a piece that I hadn't written yet. And what I decided to go with is to imagine how this piece could have gone and write it now at this point as the sixth part. And then following that, I would imagine another way that that piece could have gone and write that as the second part following six. And I remember, uh, I remember a discussion with the conductor of this piece where he, he was complaining that it was confusing because the score says one and then six and then two and then five. And I said that I think it's important in that it would help interpretation. It, it might help understand. It might help the performers understand that this is something that's supposed to come in much later, but it's presented now. So it's a form study, essentially. The first part temporarily comprises roughly half of the piece and it's written only in one pitch and I've done this before um, and the reason is that pitch is very powerful it can be so powerful that if you're trying to have timbres and colors emerge pitch can be distracting where it, it draws the ear and you hear only that and so I isolate these other things in roughly half of the piece to hopefully tune your ear to these other changes for when they happen later on.
I see AJ nodding. That's a good sign. I'd like to perform the work. <laughs> there's, there's, there's poetry. The, the, in the, in, 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 in this one, Don. I think, I think I heard this before. And, and, and uh, the, the irony or the paradox, the, the plan was to, to create some kind of disorder in an ordering system. Do I read you right, Dominic? Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. creating an order, yeah, but, but, deliberately yeah, creating but, but, disorder, but, but, and then trying to order that disorder. Yes, precisely because it, it th there is order. In fact, the resultant order with that. Uh, I, I very much appreciate the, the beginning. That there are there are about a hundred pieces, perhaps, that have this one note thing, starting yeah. from Sanapis's uh, 
metastasis and teratector and uh, all of those and there are other pieces. Uh, but this is this somehow uh, for some reason I couldn't explain the the use of one note thing in the beginning here in the first half of the piece. In fact, it uh, remains to be fresh. I couldn't I I I couldn't pinpoint what aspect of that of your uh, building up has made this so sound fresh i mean it, it's always a challenge to, to use cliche and in fact uh, i would understand why felice Anne would actually uh, resent any kind of cliche uh, i i would i would too because uh, a cliche is a cliche it's like <laughs> but um to use a material and over determinedly uh, transcend the existence of that or that material being a cliche is such a challenge. I think uh, I think this this piece has uh, achieved that in that sense. Yeah, I also very deliberately did a lot of things that we have been told over the years not to do, where I use thirds and sixths. The end is a very very self conscious cadence. I mean, it is recognizably a cadence. And I think for me at this point, I was fairly conscious that this might very well be my last piece. And I thought, to hell with it, I'll throw everything out the window and write what I want. And this is what came out. One thing that I find interesting about this piece, though, is that it's around the same length as Et was das nur schön ist. And um, in Etvas, arguably, there's a lot more going on. But I find this, when I listen to this, I'm always surprised that was 10 minutes. I, I'd never understood why. Do any of you have an idea? Maybe you were enjoying, enjoying listening to, to this one more so that um, you're really engaged into it and you, you don't um, feel the time. There's some conditioning in, in the, I don't know how you frame the moments. And I think it was very evident and effective um, how you did the, like the first part, that it's long enough and that all the things that happen next just felt like um, maybe something more would come or I'm expecting something more or in, in a good way, yeah. Uh, I think the I think the anticipation is actually shortening the perceived time as uh, the felt time uh, here in Noh, and um, I think that in uh, at at Vashrun, <laughs> I always I don't remember the title completely um, because there is more happening. I am already how you say I'm already expecting a lot of things happening so that the how you say my perception of time is longer because ah okay it's the same uh, not the same but it's like driving down the road and you see more buildings it's it feels longer than when you're driving through a meadow and you see um sparse um trees and then sometimes no trees sometimes just a cow i don't know if that's it's my perception of time, maybe, <laughs> of felt time. <laughs> okay, do you mean that um, it's because of the variation later as composed to the relative stasis in the beginning? Probably, because I'm, I'm anticipating something uh, to emerge from the stasis at the beginning. Yeah, well, the thing with um, Etwas Schönes is that it's actually a binary form, and we didn't listen to the second but um but huh, maybe actually i in my experience of the piece it's also i'm probably gonna talk like the your usual contemporary music composer anyway <laughs> uh i'm gonna admit to that but it's like hearing drones like this uh, we like people will actually appreciate also the emerging sound worlds, the micro sound worlds that come out of it, and the fact that there are lots of interesting timbral uh, sonorities that come out. That makes it really like uh, something very interesting. Like like 
my perception of this actually like I'm hearing one pitch, but I'm actually hearing overtones. I'm hearing the perfect fifth. I'm hearing I'm hearing all these uh, shimmering uh, harmonics actually. Also, was... be, uh, be also just also because of the instrumentation, uh, the orchestration of those uh, of this single pitch, basically. Yeah, that was uh, what I was hoping for. That um, because you expect to hear changes in pitch and you don't have that. Although, as um, as John has pointed out, it's it's been done lots of times. But yeah, that's what I was hoping for. That you would be more sensitive to all of these other things that can also make music interesting. But at the same time, it also feels like, um, um, on one hand, as Jonas had said a while ago, like there's a certain poetic, um, you, you actually hear the, the, the coherence of all of, these, uh, all of these moments. But at the same time, I'm very fascinated with what is invisible here. And I would say that is the actual creation of the work. There had been processes uh, there were, there's this dramaturgy, there's this uh, deliberate uh, action of like uh, tearing out all things and putting them back in order, which I think actually alludes to um, what I would say, like the composer is performative in this sense. We, we, we have talked about agency as well in the past episodes. And I'm really just uh, very captured with what is, f what is not said about the piece. It's uh, an experiencing the piece, you hear this, you hear this certain object. And uh, this is also probably why going back to what was talked about in the beginning about discourse and about uh, the listener's engagement or, or people's engagement with art, that I feel that like there's also merit in actually talking about it <laughs> or providing space for the invisible to be made known. And uh, I wonder like why, um, what were the again as a response to the uh, the environment that you were in? Like, how uh, did you come about with such an idea? It was mostly a reaction. At this point in time, I was very much a hermit. <laughs> I remember um, I had just finished Prefab Three, which I think none of you have seen. But you remember the series, right? Prefab. Um, I had just written Prefab Three, which was exhausting. And that was entirely my fault because I had planned it as um, something that builds on something else that builds on something else that builds on something else. And the very first piece of that series was framework where I build a structure and I impose on myself that every succeeding piece in this series will use that structure, but will focus on something else. And um, Prefab Dry was, uh, was Sightram. I was expanding how far I could stretch time, um, stretch nothing. I remember one point of contention with my teacher then with Dieter Mack was I had written a rest and then above it I wrote 31 seconds and he said this is way too long and, um, <laughs> and I said no it stays. And then I, I played around with it, shortening it and all of that. And, and in the end, it stayed. And um, it was conducted by Shongwan Beck. And um, he, he got the intention that 31 seconds of intense concentration where the performers are not playing anything can be an extremely tense moment. But it can also flop. It can, it can very, very badly flop. And he pulled it off, and my kudos to strong one. That was that was awesome what he did. But yeah, it it was a very exhausting work to write. I was very very tired when I finished that, and I wrote this immediately after. Um, so that was where I was coming from, where I just wanted to play. I I didn't want to think too much, so I thought about the structure as I described earlier. I wrecked the structure and then I tried to organize it again and um, and I wanted to play. And I'm not sure if I am probably uh, correct in saying so but it feels to me like a, it's a form of satire as well. <laughs> it felt like a form of uh, humor I would say at the very least. It is I guess. Um, writing prefab dry I was coming from a period of a year where I couldn't write 
and um i had been composing for well, i don't know 15 years and i think i was getting very tired of the whole thing and this is partly why i was anticipating that um, I sent my master arbeit to some of you and you probably wrote that um, I was anticipating that I probably wouldn't be writing anymore after that. It's just exhaustion. And I guess I was partly making fun of myself in the process. Um, I'm just wondering why um, we tend to underestimate um, like single tones or long tones. This is a question to everyone because... Yeah, I personally find it shun. <laughs> and yeah, uh, so there are many things you can do with it. And um, it's also true that uh, it's, it's a cliche as well. But um, yeah, we, we always, um, I, I, I could just notice, I mean, not, not just us, but in general, that there is some, yeah, like an underestimation of, of this. So I wonder what, everyone thinks or if you have a comment on that <laughs> as a singer um i think i have a fear of when i see long sustained notes especially when it's um bang, um single note or, or one note because in my head a lot of things go through like oh no am i gonna stay on pitch am i gonna you know the things and i'm not perfect pitch so i always just rely on either practicing that for a long time so I get the feel of the note of that pitch or relying to what I hear <laughs> but that's all that's that's always been my fear when I see those notes so I think those but drones or or single notes they're always underestimated because um the the initial the initial um impression we have on it is it's 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 stagnant that's the the initial um parang in, um how people per, will uh think when they see uh something sige, let's use the term alone or something standing something that that appears to be existing on its own but in this piece it it's it's not on its own it's um because what goes through my head, it's like it's a canvas, and then you see nothing, but you imagine, you see, you um, you don't see anything literally, but you see it. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah. it has a lot to do with perception. I mean, we yeah, actively yeah. imagine things. It's kind of like looking yeah, at a yeah, wall yeah, with yeah, wallpaper yeah. and starting to see animals yeah. and people talking to you and thinking you're going crazy. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that one. Pauline was talking about um, how she fears long notes. Um, as a composer, you should be able to perform those long notes. But as a conductor, I think uh, I, I think I'm so fearful of having long notes in the written piece, counting and everything. But I always find it very refreshing in a way, and that, that's why uh, knock. I was thinking about how to describe it. It's like uh, a non-conformity to conformity, something like that. And to answer uh, Felice's question, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not afraid of using long notes. In fact, um, I I always keep on talking to uh, members of the Ripeno and some, and how they know that when I write, I write. Uh, right melodies, they will always be based on one or two notes only. Many composers using that one note, one note. I mean, when I listened to Nock earlier, uh, maybe about three to five composers came to mind already. First of all, I was expecting that there will be changes in pitches, but on the other hand, I was... Comf comfortable in that one note that uh, even though there even if uh, no other notes or no other pitches will be introduced after it I will find it really refreshing I don't know I just want to share something really quick while we're on the topic of one note 
I think it's here. I want to highlight it. Where it's um, several bars of holding the same pitch. And then at the end of it, it says, hold as long as you possibly can. And, <laughs> and I remember the first time that the trombonist saw this, he said, I'm not even going to get to that fermata. So I don't know what as long as you possibly can, you still expect when I get there. I find so much parallelisms again with <laughs> with uh, what was presented uh, earlier, uh, Paghinga. I think it all like goes full in full circle back to that uh, idea of just like uh, relying on the performer's agency. Mm -hmm. Right. Very much. I'm just fascinated as how how uh, well even in the case of Dominic, uh, old cliches are refurbished to become fresh. I mean that's. Uh, nothing is really new, but 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 what really matters is how how new ideas or or no no new receptions come out of the way that old ideas are being used. It 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 seems to point out also some parallelism to let's say a uh, a modernist arrangement of a Dufay uh, chanson. Uh, I'm particularly uh, pointing to Isabel Mundri's uh, Dufay Biar Baitung and or 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 Johannes Schulhorn's uh, Anamorphose again the, this 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 Schulhorn's uh, piece which is uh, a take on uh, Bach's Kunsterfuge where he looks at the different angles but well, what an Anamorphose is uh, looking at different angles of, of of, of the same object. I mean, the, 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 that concept uh, came to mind also when Felice Anne was talking about her, her piece. Although here we have object and, 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 and uh, that kind of freshness coming from an old object, I think it's a very, it's, it's, it's where I think, well, I would think the, the notion of new is going to in, in after everything has been exhausted, uh, countless times in the praxis of, of what we call new music. And, 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 and I think that, that that's a very fresh uh, take on that thing. Uh, I just hope Dominic comes back to composing. And, and, and when he comes back to composing, I think it will be very different. Just as he uses the old, uh, the old cliches, giving it a fresh uh, poetry, so to say, using the old words into a new poetry. Um, um, when you come back to composing eventually, and I was, I could just foresee that you would do that in the future, perhaps uh, when the itch comes back, so to say. I hope uh, you would re uh, you would really uh, appreciate yourself for that in that sense. So I think it's a very good conclusion to uh, to today's discussion. Uh, so we will wrap this up for today, and I hope everyone will actually follow us on the next episodes of MCL Talk. So stay tuned and goodbye.
Thank you. 